Hello, I'm Dick Guthrie. I'm one of the Chance Vault retirees that helped restore this famous aircraft. The airplane was designed and built by Chance Vault back in 1939-1940 to demonstrate the aerodynamic concepts of this flying wing concept. The airplane was designated as the V-173 by Chance Vought, but because of its unique shape, it became known as the Flying Pancake, and that's what we all call it today. In 1947, the airplane was retired and sent to the Naval Air Station in Norfolk, Virginia. And it was there until 1961 when it was moved to the Gerber facility at uh, Suitland, Maryland for the National Aerospace Museum, Smithsonian. After it was uh, stored there for several years, one of the uh, Chance Vault executives spotted the airplane in the storage facility there at Gerber and immediately started a conversation with the Smithsonian to let the Chance Vault retirees restore this airplane. That was in uh, the year 2000. It took about three years for the Chance Vault executives to convince the uh, Smithsonian that the retirees had the capability of uh, safely moving the airplane to our facility in Grand Prairie, Texas, and that we had the people and the skills to restore this airplane to its original configuration. In 2003, uh, the airplane was moved from Suitland, Maryland to the Grand Prairie facility in uh, Texas, where the retirees took on the job of restoring this uh, airplane. After the airplane had been in storage for so long, and a lot of that time it was in uh, stored in an outdoor facility, the, the airplane was in pretty bad shape. And for you to understand uh, what it took to restore this airplane, I, I want to tell you a little bit about how it was constructed. The forward end of the airplane, all the nacelles uh, for the propellers and the cockpit were all aluminum. The uh, area next to the cockpit here is fiber, is uh, plywood. The rest of the airplane from this point to the rear is all wood truss structure that's covered with uh, cloth. This surface, these surfaces top and bottom are all cotton cloth that's been tautened to uh, resemble a metallic surface. These very large propellers of this aircraft are made from wood. Uh, the total diameter is 16 feet 6 inches. It was learned early on in the program that standard fixed propellers would not work for this large size because uh, any kind of side gust or disturbance causes too much uh, bending of the props and could result in, in damage to the aircraft. Uh, for that reason, these props are hinged, or in other words, they flap just like they do on a helicopter. Uh, that because they flap, you can't uh, have them unrestricted flapping, so there are hydraulic flap dampers built into the hub of the aircraft. Of course, the propellers also have variable pitch, and uh, this is controlled by the cockpit and also by a Hamilton Standard Constant Speed Controller. The, the propellers have a flapping feature like helicopters, you watch this motion, but it, that flapping is, is hydraulically damped to keep it in control. The aircraft has large propellers because they are more efficient for this application, but because they are so large and the engine is, each engine is 80 horsepower, the propeller speed has to be significantly reduced from engine speed. Behind the, um, this, the prop here, just inside the nacelle, there's a planetary gearbox that reduces engine speed to about, uh, uh, reduces prop speed 
from engine speed about one sixth. In other words, a six to one reduction. So that in normal flight, the propellers are turning about 400 RPM while the engine's turning about 2,500 RPM. Because the V-173 uh, is capable of very slow fly flight, uh, it is very imperative that both propellers be providing the same uh, thrust at all times. To make this happen, the two propellers are connected through the engines with a cross shaft. So that this cross shaft makes sure that the propeller speed and the power to both propellers is always the same. The in, each engine, which are, are buried uh, back in this area of the fuselage, each engine has a uh, 90 degree gearbox and it also has a sprag or a one-way clutch. So if an engine were to fail, that engine just drops out and you still get this equal but less power to both propellers. The cross shafting runs, runs from uh, an outboard gearbox to the engine, the other engine, and to the other gearbox. And it uh, runs right behind the, the uh, cockpit, right behind where the pilot sits. This V-173 uh, pancake aircraft is a flying qualities prototype for a later Navy fighter plane of the same concept, which would have been much more powerful and faster. This aircraft has 280 horsepower Continental engines, uh, which gave it a top speed of 138 miles an hour. Uh, it was controllable in flight down to 25 miles an hour and it could take off in, with no wind and, and the, roll, the takeoff roll is about 200 feet, so it's very remarkable flying characteristics. The XF-5U aircraft that was to have been built by the, for the Navy was projected to have a top speed of around 460 miles an hour. It, the aircraft was the same size as this one but it was much heavier and it had two 1,350 horsepower radial engines, so it was somewhat of a beast. Uh, it was that high speed of 400 something miles an hour in 1942 that really interested the Navy. So this was the prototype to develop the pen flying quality characteristics for the later Navy fighter. The V-173 uh, has a very light uh, structure. Most of what you see is is very light uh, wood truss structure covered with cotton fabric and, and dope. The dry weight of the aircraft is 2,670 pounds. The typical flight weight was 3,050 pounds. That's with, of course, with pilot and full fuel. This aircraft has two of these engines. They're Continental C-75 engines. At the, in 1941, this was a brand new engine design, and this may have been one of the first applications of that engine. Later, it was used in thousands of uh, Piper Cubs and Taylor Craft and other aircraft. This engine was normally carbureted, and that's at 75 horsepower. This engine is fairly unique in that it has mechanical fuel injection, and that's prob probably credited with the extra five horsepower, and it's rated at 80 horsepower. Um, this engine is, for, for flight at low speed, since this engine is buried back in the fuselage, it would not get cooling air. So it has a fan on the front here, with, you can see the blades, and that fan is in a shroud, so it, it's always pulling air through the cooling air in there. This air is forced up in the bottom of the engine, comes up through these ducts that are around the cylinders, and then exit out, exits from the top of the aircraft. There is an exit flap that is controlled by the pilot, so the pilot control the engine can control engine temperature. Um, the engine is started by a pull handle. It's this handle right here. And to start the aircraft, there's a little door on each side. If you open this door, you reach up inside and grab this handle and pull it out and then you give it a hard yank. This turns the engine one quarter of a revolution. If you have the engine properly primed and the and the mags needles are on, then the engine would start. Each engine was installed through an access panel as you will see 
back in this area here. And we have a small access panel here, which was actually used for access to the hand crank, which is the way this engine was started. So in order to start the engine, the access panel would be open. You would reach up, grab a hold of the hand crank, hand crank and give it a pull and hope that the engine started. The requirements from the Smithsonian were that each engine be checked for rust. One was completely disassembled. The other one was partially disassembled. Uh, this one is on display purposes so you can see what the engine looks like. The other engine was reinstalled <coughs> after we finished the uh, uh, overhaul of the engine. Uh, one question that has frequently come up is would this airplane fly? Uh, number one, the Smithsonian had dictated that this airplane will not fly and furthermore the hydraulic lines and so forth that are in the engine uh, or in the aircraft uh, are basically those that were originally installed when the aircraft was built somewhere around 1940. So obviously if the airplane were to ever fly uh, you certainly would have to replace things like that because as we found in the removal and installation of the engines those were pretty brittle so uh, nevertheless the engines were in uh, really good shape having considered that they were just uh, in storage for so many years but uh, this is basically what powered the, the, uh, the aircraft so you this uh, engine on this side on the left side of the airplane had to be started first because the gearbox on that side has a centrifugal clutch. The centrifugal clutch allowed uh, this engine on the left side to be started first without having to turn the whole propulsion system, the props and the other engine. Once this engine was started and warmed up um, at, at a lower RPM, then they could raise the RPM and it would engage uh, the propellers and start turning the propellers and, and get the whole system going. Once the system is turning, now the right-hand engine, because of its one-way clutch, is not engaged with the system and then you can go over to the right engine and, and use this pull handle and start that engine and warm it up. And when it comes up to speed, then its clutch locks up and it all is locked into one system. When the uh, B-173 first arrived at Vaught and was examined, the uh, workers could, could find no battery. They thought there had to be a battery in there for, for an electrical system for the aircraft. There's a lot of electrical wiring in the aircraft. Uh, further examination finally showed that the system does not, the aircraft does not have an electrical system. The engine runs on magnetos and all the engine sensors are uh, come off the engine without need of an additional electrical power. Um, there is a large tachometer drive on the right hand prop shaft and it is my theory that that was used as a generator to provide power for the uh, various flight test instrumentation that was used in the aircraft at one time or another. We know from the flight test log that at one time they they put a recording oscillograph into the airplane probably to record say uh, eleva uh, elevator uh, angle position and, and that sort of thing. Pitch and roll control for this aircraft were provided by means of these elevators. The elevators is a coin term that's a combination of, of uh, elevator and aileron. These provide both pitch control and roll control. For pitch control, the surfaces on both sides work together. For aileron control, they work in opposite directions. There is a mechanical linkage system under the cockpit, uh, uh, under the pilot seat that does the mixing between pitch and roll for this for control. The original control surfaces were fixed surfaces like uh, on most normal airplanes where this was fixed and it had a controllable uh, surface back here that was controlled by the pilot. It was quickly found in early flights that this produced heavy control forces and 
So they changed this to an all-moving surface where the whole surface pivots. Uh, and this is all connected by pressure rods to the cockpit. There is a uh, surf control surface on the back, which is a both a um, servo tab, which helps alleviate pilot force required, and it also is the uh, pitch trim tab for the aircraft. And those there's a mixing linkage that that accomplishes that. These items sticking out on the front of the uh, elevator are balance weights and are needed to make sure the surface is balanced for proper uh, aerodynamic use. The B-173 has uh, two vertical stabilizers with very large rudders. These are uh, connected uh, from the pilot's uh, rudder pedal to the surfaces by a conventional uh, cable and pulley system. Since this was a flight test airplane, uh, the aircraft did not need a whole lot of fuel for these pretty small engines. Uh, right behind the, the cockpit, bulkhead, there are two cylindrical 10 gallon tanks for a total of 20 gallons of fuel in the aircraft. And the tanks are high enough that it's a strictly gravity feed to, to the bottom of the engines to the fuel injection units. So there is no fuel pump. The original V-173, when it first flew, did not have these movable flaps here on the back of the aircraft. This was a fixed trailing edge. It was found in flight test that it, on landing, it was difficult to keep the nose up. Uh, this aircraft, because of its large surface area, has a large ground effect. And that ground effect, with coming in with the angle of attack, would push the tail up and the nose down. And which is not good. So they modified the aircraft and put these large uh, trailing edge flaps on here. Now these flaps are not, as in conventional aircraft, they're not used for takeoff uh, and landing per se. What they do, these in fact are automatically actuated by air pressure. Air pressure, when they, when, when they get into ground effects, pushes the surfaces up and it has counterbalance weights in there to so that it will react at the right pressure. By allowing those surfaces to move up, it, it re reduces the, the effect of lifting the tail and it helps the pilot keep the nose of the aircraft up for landings.